how how much does reality depend on perceptions i i think uh reality depends on perception almost in lockstep okay okay so the amount of perceptions there are that's how many realities there are yeah would you say that yeah seat here sure awesome thanks for stopping mm -hmm. all right so um just kind of out for a stroll walking the dog type yep thing? I, I walk her two miles um one, once uh one uh one mile each trip so twice a day she gets a mile walk got it and uh, so this is her evening walk. She gets one in the morning. Um, typically, the one in the morning is shortly after breakfast, and the one in the evening is shortly after dinner. Right and on. So she can read an analog clock. Oh, really? Yeah, she uh, knows when it's dinner time because she sits on the sofa, and she watches the clock, and when the big hand is on the six and the little hand is on the four she reminds me it's dinner Tell time huh yeah <laughs> now what about when the uh what about when the time changes she was an hour early a few weeks ago when we changed. okay at, at least for as far as sun time goes she was an hour early no that she's uh, totally clock uh motivated now i uh i had a a co-worker that had a little dog um, that always used to wake her up at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think it was 5.11 every day. And she said that even when the time changed, the dog would somehow know that it had. That it, that I, the time I, had I, would, I would be willing to bet that there was a clock someplace that it was looking at. Like uh, it, it, it would refer to a clock? Yep. It's not uncommon for for smart dogs to learn how to do that. Um, and uh, another thing that uh, uh, people who have video cameras that are in their house and can watch their dog while they're at work, uh, they'll notice their dog uh, uh, getting excited to greet them when they come home before they actually get to the door. So while they're driving home, the dog is cued off of a clock or something else and said, well, he'll be home in a few minutes. And the dog wanders over by the door and waits for him to come home. So there's some sort of reference that they're... That they're yeah, using. and I again, I, I believe that it's a clock. I know it's with with her because she she sits on the sofa and, and watches the clock. She's very obvious about the uh, clock being a reference. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Well, they're, uh, they're, uh, dogs are spectacular animals. They really are. I mean, all animals are spectacular Yeah. Uh, because they all have very specialized talents. Uh, but I, I think dog is spectacular because they've adapted so well to living with humans. Uh, and it's not just the companionship thing. I mean, they do, uh, you read a story about a, 
a heroic dog every day mm -hmm. about people, dogs who've saved people's lives, who've detected cancer, who've uh, found uh, uh, people in the forest, those kinds of mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Rescues uh, mm -hmm. type. Yeah, they're, they can be pretty smart. Yeah. Um, do you want to give your first name? Yes, it's Tom. Tom? Yeah. T? Yeah, T-O-M. O-M. Right. Cool. Good to meet you, Tom. My name's David. Hi, David. And uh, today I'm out here um, conducting interviews. Mm -hmm. And I'm having uh, people choose something that they, that they want to talk about, something that's meaningful to them, a conclusion that, uh, that you think is true. Mm -hmm. And from a neutral perspective, what I'm doing is I'm asking questions that explore how you arrived at the conclusion mm -hmm. and what supports your confidence that the conclusion is true. Okay. Uh, does that sound good? Yes. And you're okay if I record? Yes. Okay, great. Awesome. Well, um, is there something that you want to talk about, a, a topic that you have that that's meaningful to you that... that uh, would affect your behavior for, if you found out that you were mistaken about it. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I have a grandson who lives in Boston. I only have one son, uh, one child, one son. Okay. Um, and um, the family uh, lives in Andover. Okay. Um, and uh, my oldest grandson is six, and uh, my youngest uh, grandson is uh, three, soon to be four. Okay. My youngest grandson, uh, just under two years ago, contracted leukemia. Leukemia? Leukemia. Um, and fortunately, when I was a kid, uh, I'm 74, uh, when I was three and a half years old, had I been diagnosed with any form of leukemia, I would have died. Mm -hmm. Today, um, the survival rate is remarkable. Uh, uh, the survival rate for... Um, uh, for children with cancer, with, with uh, leukemia, which is cancer of the blood, mm -hmm. um, is about 90%. Um, and uh, there are certain types of cancer that are more easily treated than others. Sure, yeah. Uh, and fortunately, my grandson had the type of cancer that, um, that everybody, <laughs> if you have to have cancer, everybody hopes you get that one. That's the one to get, huh? Yeah. Uh, there, there's a couple of them that are comparable, but uh, his was the one that they have a, basically the highest success rate. With. Okay. There's not a lot of difference in the treatments between uh, what uh, is involved in treating one type of leukemia over another. There's just some that are just more resistant to the treatment that they have. Um, and it's, a, um, it's an interesting treatment in that, uh, you know, they basically poison the patient with oh, okay. the chemotherapy mm -hmm. uh, and the, at one point they actually they actually kill all of the patient's bone marrow all of okay. it so they have no immune system at all at that point right time. right uh, and they did that with my grandson his name is Eric well uh, pr prior to the time, both both Eric and his brother are very active uh, boys. They're they're competitive, always have been. Uh, but um, his brother Adam was a um, he was a difficult child. He um, he had um, uh, uh, mood swings and uh, he would get angry about things. He he had. Um, uh, trouble controlling his emotions. This is the older brother. Older brother, uh -huh. right. Um, and uh, so, um, and he wasn't always um, the the kindest brother that you could have. Mm. Um, he didn't hurt his younger brother, but uh, he would do mean things mm. uh, to him uh, that a six-year-old, of course, is perfectly capable of doing. Yeah. So uh, when Eric uh, got sick, uh, and this is true of all uh, leukemia patients, they're very sick when in the early stages because the, they don't typically detect it until the patient is really in pretty poor shape. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, he had a, a pain in his ankle that wouldn't go away. 
And fortunately, uh, uh, they, uh, well, he sprained his ankle, that kind of thing. But it just, week after week, it just didn't go away, and it got worse. And they took him to a doctor uh, in, in Boston who um, did some blood tests on him and, and you know, think he, he was not a cancer specialist, mm -hmm. but said, you need to get him uh, over to the Carver Center right away and, uh, and just make sure that they can rule this out. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't. Um, and uh, they, they couldn't rule out the leukemia. Right. Uh, and his white count was very high. And then they confirmed that it was, in fact, uh, this certain strain of leukemia that was uh, that was fortunately easy to treat, but it was still going to be two years of pretty rough therapy. So um, uh, Eric was actually in the hospital from uh, uh, September. This was nearly two years ago now. Um, it clear through uh, just before the Christmas holidays, so that's like three months. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and he was in isolation ward because he was very susceptible to uh, infections and those kind of things. And and there's always some uh, crisis. He he had a uh, uh, some of these drugs that they have uh, get give them severe constipation. He had trouble with his bowel and bunch of side effects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, side effects and. Uh, so he was a very sick boy, and uh, his brother uh, could only go visit him through a window and that, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, during that, that period, um, Adam, who had, uh, the older brother, had not really wanted to uh, help around the house that much. I mean, you know, he was... He was just stubborn mm -hmm. more than he wasn't a bad boy. He just wanted he was trying to assert himself. And all of a sudden he became really quite helpful with his mom. Okay. His brother's not there. Uh, very concerned about his brother, uh, did art projects for him and made sure that make sure that Eric gets these. Um, uh, always wanted to wish. Eric well when he couldn't go to visit when only his parents were allowed and mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it was that was really quite heartwarming but then uh, Eric came home and everyone kind of expected Adam to go back to the way he was and he right. did and he didn't okay so it, 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 it was a permanent was a permanent change permanent change in his behavior and now that, of course, Adam, for over a year, has been home that whole time, he still has in-home treatments. He gets his chemotherapy there at home. And some, you know, the steroid injections and things, uh, he, uh, I mean, the parents do those things. They don't, they, uh, when they're not in a hospital setting, they have to learn how to do all those treatments. Yeah, they become the caretakers. Right, yeah. exactly. And, of course, it took uh, um, now... Uh, Adam, who was the center of attention uh, for the first f four years, three years of his life, yeah. uh, has to cope with the fact that mom and dad really have something that they need to do at this moment with Eric. Not that Adam wasn't getting attention. They're very good about balancing the way. But, but when it came to therapy, that's something that had to be done, and Adam had to understand it. And he yeah. did. Yeah. And, and sometimes um, that can be hard without any cancer, like for the older sibling to not get as much of, the, of attention as they used to before right. the other kid was born. And stuff. Right. So this sounds like this kind of um, in, increased that or they would they were thinking that it would. But whenever he needed to be helpful around the house and everything and his attitude kind of got better and it stayed and it stayed there. And, and it did and it didn't require prompting was mm -hmm. the interesting thing okay. and he didn't lapse back into his old behavior mm -hmm. uh when uh eric came home and so what what my uh i i thought that uh they were going to be teenagers before they were best buds and sidekicks and inseparable and that kind of thing mm -hmm. But that didn't happen. And I think um, that um, this, um, this crisis, this catharsis that the whole family went through hastened that uh, process of bonding with his brother. 
And so while uh, uh, something like leukemia you wouldn't wor wish on anybody, right? I, I think that, that there are examples of, of stresses that happen in families that have beneficial results. Mm. I don't like to say that every family should go through some kind of stress. I right, mean, divorce right. is, of course, hard on children. But I think we underestimate children's ability to be resilient and in the right setting really benefit from that kind of thing. And if I found that that wasn't the case, I would be di very disappointed. Mm. Because I, I've seen it myself from afar, uh, and I honestly believe that... that um, this wasn't a life-changing experience just for the younger son, but for the older son and the whole family as well. And that um, while it's been uh, it's a terrible, nerve-wracking experience, I mean, it was for me being 3,000 miles away and having to get all the news by telephone. Yeah, I bet, yeah. Uh, Are you pretty close? Like, do they... Do they... I haven't seen the family now in almost three years okay. uh, because it's difficult. Uh, they're they're a little still a little afraid of bringing uh, uh, unexpected infections sure, into yeah. the house, and uh, uh, so his his uh, grandmother, uh, my daughter-in-law's mother, uh, who lives in Pennsylvania, uh, uh, helps the family quite often. Uh, uh, she lives down in Florida now, but she did when this started. She lived in Pennsylvania, uh -huh. um, and, and she's she's a wonderful woman. She uh, she is very uh, she's one of the she was a teacher, <laughs> and and so she can handle uh, the, uh, uh, the stress of kids. And the stuff? stress of kids was what I, I uh, the good good word for it, uh -huh. uh, and. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and can really, I think, take that stressful situation, make it into a positive experience. But uh -huh. so she is able to, and I think that they, uh, she's very careful about who she exposes herself to, so that she'll be available to help if, mm -hmm. you know, something comes up and my and and our uh, mutual kids, the adults, need to uh, to have her come in and help which she's done several times when when things were uh everything was coming together at once and it was hard for the uh there were uh mandatory hospital stays through that it's been a year and a half since he started his treatment uh -huh. so about every six months he went in for like a week just because that's the way the regimen right. works and uh, so their their mom has a good way of kind of being able to handle all that. And, yeah, and yeah. The 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 support of the family um, uh, there in the east is is very high. Okay. And I mean, I do what I can to support them, but I There's live so three thousand miles away. Yeah. So, um, so what do we what do we want to say about this? Is there is there a specific conclusion um, that we can explore with all this? I'm thinking. I mean, there's a couple ways we can do it. We can say. Um, something like this particular crisis was what caused the attitude change in the older kid? I, I think that's true. I don't think that, I, I think it would have happened at some point anyway. Okay. Uh, it, in other words, uh, he wouldn't go his whole life uh, being at odds with his younger brother. I don't, I don't believe that to be the case at all. He always uh, showed a, a, a tendency to... Uh, um, when he wasn't irritated with his younger brother to uh -huh. want to spend time with him. Okay, okay. Uh, but, uh, but clearly that, to me, that, um, um, uh, I mean, it was a sea change in his attitude, not just with regard to his younger brother, but about everybody. It was a, it, it was a, a process of maturation that instead of taking uh, maybe 10 years to accomplish, took place in a year and a half. Okay. Um. We could also make it more general. Uh, we could also explore maybe a conclusion that you think is true that um, something like crises can um, crises can can be beneficial. They, I think or, they can. I, like I mean, I, I think there's something to that um, uh, that uh, age-old saying that. Uh, uh, the the person 
had a tough life. He was or she was tempered by fire, uh, you know, like like uh, like steel hardened uh, because of adversity. Uh, and I, I think that uh, Americans uh, uh, want to have everything. Um, why not? I mean, uh, wouldn't you like a life that was that, that was nothing but happiness every minute of every day? Mm. I don't think that's natural. Mm. Uh, I, I think what is natural is that we have uh, uh, we take a hit, and then then we have to deal with the consequences of that, and and be able to have a. Uh, uh, if you if you get if you react negatively, I think to to every adversity, I think you're going to have a pretty tough life. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't develop the ability to somewhat roll with the punches and and get some benefit out of out of the the negative element that's entered your life, um, you, you can't you just can't expect to have a life that's free of those kind of things. So therefore, okay. without developing that ability to uh, have a uh, uh, a, a strong emotional response to something that's pretty bad, um, you're you're in trouble. And and we expect, I think, too much uh, out of life uh, to to roll in our favor. I I, I think that that's a, a modern characteristic of people. Okay, what do you think causes that? What do you, what do you think caused the ability or the change that your that your grandkids experienced what do you think caused um that uh that situation where you know he he said he kind of turned into a better kid yeah sort of what, what do you what do you think um what do you think the underlying cause is for that that's a tough one um because i'm uh i'm not sure that there are some people who are better able to do that than others uh -huh. I think the general tendency uh, of, of Americans to uh, uh, really receive bad news poorly uh, uh, has uh, something to do. I, I'm a baby boomer. Uh, you know what that means. Yeah. So I was raised in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh -huh. And my generation was really one of the first generations ever that kind of had everything. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I mean, I I grew up in a middle class family, but I mean, a middle class family was pretty comfortable compared to the life that my mom and dad lived during the 30s and in the 20s. Yeah. Uh, and that was same with my friends too. Their parents had had known real hardship. They had known hunger. Some of them. They had known uh, really unbearably hard work. They had known war. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and in my generation knew war too. I mean, we, uh, uh, we were the generation that largely participated in the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And it was horrible. Uh, but, uh, but in terms of the rest of society, um, uh, the life growing up in the 1950s and 60s, other than, than that, was, was uh, pretty idyllic. And and our 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 parents, my my mom and dad, my son's grandparents were, um, I think that they wanted to shield um, their children and their grandchildren from the the suffering mm -hmm. that they had, and uh, and uh, I didn't really know uh, uh, suffering. I had heard stories about. The poverty that my mom and dad lived in, but I couldn't equate to it. Yeah. Uh, I had a warm place to sleep every night. I always had plenty of food. I had warm clothing, uh, transportation basically at will. Uh, and um, so, uh, I, I mean, I think I and, and really a lot of other people in my generation, and, and I think we pass that on to maybe an amplified degree to our own children, um, came to expect only the better things in life, to not uh, have to uh, anticipate adversity, that it just shouldn't happen. Uh -huh. um, and, um, and so we became, 
we didn't have much practice in dealing with it. Everybody has low parts in their life. I'm not saying that they don't, but I'm saying life crises uh, uh, today, I think are less in magnitude than life crises were 75 years ago or 90 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we just don't have the practice in in having to pull yourself up from something that's really devastating, um, uh, a natural disaster. I mean, those, of course, still happen. People still get killed and their houses get ruined by hurricanes and tornadoes. Yeah. But um, for, the, for the most part, people don't have to deal with a crisis of that magnitude any time in their life. Lifespan and that kind of thing. Yeah, better. and all of these things have improved. Uh, 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 the diseases that used to result in just uh, endless suffering for a long period of time and ending in death, they still we still have those things. But but there's the ability to for pain management now that was never there before. Uh, again, uh, 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 hunger, while it exists in America, it's nothing like it was in the 1930s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I think that has something to do with it. And I'm not rec recommending that, that we have uh, a national crisis uh, all the time. But um, I, I frankly think that, that people uh, responded to COVID very poorly. Uh -huh. Uh, I, I think they did because it, it was a crisis. People were dying, but, but we know now that the people who died, um, uh, the vast majority of them had what they call comorbidity. It's not a good thing to die for any reason, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but... Um, like they weren't healthy to they begin They weren't with. healthy to begin with, uh -huh. and, uh, and we, we weren't able to look at those and say, um, well... Uh, People throughout the millennia have dealt with these kind of things, and and society moved on. We just locked up society, uh, and, and it, it was a, it was a poor response. I think I think we we all needed to be more uh, courageous in the face of of that kind of thing, and we weren't. Okay, we could we could talk about COVID. Um, we could we could explore a conclusion about that. Um, well, I'm not an expert in it by any sure, sense. Yeah. I, all I have is opinions. Uh, another thing that we could explore is, you, you kind of touched on this a little bit, about, um, like, in order to appreciate life, is suffering required? I think so. I really do. I think it's, an, it, it's a human, part of the human condition. Uh, I think without, uh, without something to, to test uh, your ability to keep, plodding forward that you'll just stay in one place a good life requires suffering yes would that be something that we can well at least it requires challenge uh okay. if if the challenge uh, meets the the definition of suffering then maybe so but i i don't think i mean i i think of the huge suffering that's happened throughout history and and i don't necessarily think all of that was a good thing for mankind but but, but certainly disappointment, uh, I think, has to be part of life. A and in a bigger proportion, I think, that, than we're used to as Americans. What would be your definition for suffering? Well, certainly uh, pain that goes on for a long period of time. Uh, uh, hunger, uh, anguish, fear. Uh, okay. In other words, uh, 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 true, true fear that, uh, for instance, that that you're of a class that can't be accepted, and that uh -huh. you'll never you'll n never uh, grow out of your current situation because what uh, because of others uh, and their opinion or or uh -huh. treatment of you rather than your own abilities. That that's suffering without question. Uh, and suffering would be kind of too strong of a word. I don't know I, because I don't know the limits of it. Uh, again, I. I, I I believe that I've been one of the fortunate people in history who's never really suffered very much. Okay. Uh, and uh, so it's hard for me to tell. But, uh, I mean, I think of, of uh, refugees, for instance, in war zones. There's true suffering. You're displaced. You're hungry. You're without clothes. You're, you're fearful of uh, every step that you make that, that it may be your last because of... Uh, 
of hostilities. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous. Yeah, dangerous. Yeah, war zone type thing. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly suffering. That's got to be suffering at the highest level. Okay, so so you wouldn't necessarily say that that's the kind of suffering that's required no. for somebody to live a... a a, no, and, and God forbid life. that. I, I think I think humans would are, are uh, reach their highest point when they they have uh, adversity, okay. uh, challenges. But when they have true suffering, that they they ret retrogress. What if we were to explore the conclusion that uh, a good life requires adversity? Yes. Okay. I'll agree with that. Okay. All right. Okay. And, and and then on the other side of that, it requires that you develop the ability to manage adversity. Okay. But it we, requires the adversity in the beginning. In, in, in the, the beginning, yeah. And then and then you use that to learn how to manage it and mitigate its impact. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um all right. So a good life requires adversity. Um and is it okay if I ask a couple of questions about this? Yeah. Okay. Um, generally speaking, how, what percentage of your beliefs or your conclusions would you prefer to be accurate? Like if, if, if we had a, a pie chart, mm -hmm. um, how much that pie chart would be full of, um, the, the percentage of your beliefs to be accurate? Um, I, I believe very strongly in, uh, uh in, in what you've helped me conclude mm -hmm. here. I would yeah. say, just generally that, speaking though, right, like, uh, that I'm night, I'm 90% certain that, that without adversity, without adversity, people can't thrive. Okay. So you're saying you're 90% confident that this is true. Yes. That this particular claim is true. Yeah. 90. Okay. Yeah. That was going to be my, my, uh, my second question. Um, but as far as just general, generally speaking, um, this aside, what, what, um, what percentage of your conclusions would you prefer to align with reality? Ah, that's an interesting question. In other words, um, if the reality is, is that, uh, because reality is perception to a large degree. We, uh, uh, there, there have been different realities that uh, people have accepted throughout human history. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Romans believed that, that it was perfectly fine to allow uh, uh, gladiatorial games. Mm -hmm. Well, that's barbaric as far as we're concerned. So we, That's we, more of a subjective thing you're saying? It, it it was it, it was no it it wasn't subjective in their time I think they would have uh, 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 largely said yep ninety percent of them say this is fine that's uh, that's the way life is uh, we need the entertainment and uh, 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 those people engaging in that uh, have the uh, um, uh, the ability to earn their freedom that way and and that's the way life ought to be. But well, we wouldn't we wouldn't see that I'm sure, uh, and we would be just as sure that 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 was wrong than they were sure that it was right. Okay, and that's so, kind of what you're saying about the differences between realities. And and per, yeah, that perception is is what what you're accustomed to in okay. in your society. What has society told you, taught you for basically your whole life up to that point and perceptions change I, I i mean i know that um, uh our um, uh, i mean we look at at uh, 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 disease different than we did when i was a young man mm -hmm. that um uh I, I remember when my my grandmother was near death uh, very ill and uh, today even then, I think if there were, uh, uh, that, uh, that she could have been, her life could have been prolonged. Mm -hmm. um, but um, she didn't want it prolonged. And um, 
because uh, uh, it was she was uh, in a great amount of, of discomfort, and there was really no long-term hope, only an extension of the current um, adversity that she was going through. Got it. Whereas I think today, um, um, or when when mom gets sick, you oh gosh, we got to do everything we can for mom. Almost leaving mom out of the conversation. Yeah. So I think that 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 has changed. That that uh, the ability to allow people to uh, the the end of life decisions I think are are now they're 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 everybody's business, but the person involved yeah. sometimes. And I, I, I that that has changed. Um, um, and I could. I, I suppose if I thought about it long enough, I could find a number of other things that uh, have changed. Well, when I was a young man, for instance, a, a boy, um, uh, uh, the automobile, a gasoline automobile was the greatest thing, the greatest invention of, of all times. And now uh, there's people who would like to ban them. Yeah. Uh, so that... that um, those That's another are also, example of yeah, and those are societal things that uh, uh, perhaps in some cases, for instance, the automobile before uh, before the 1950s, uh, Americans really hadn't seen uh, the kind of environmental damage and things like that that uh, automobiles do, and so being able to we we have more experience with certain things, and after having more experience with the things that impact our our society, then our attitudes about them change. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm interested in um, maybe exploring a little bit more about reality yeah. um, and, and your idea of it. How, how much does reality depend on perceptions? <laughs> I, I think uh, reality depends on perception almost in lockstep okay okay so the amount of perceptions there are that's how many realities there are yeah would you say that yeah now i don't want to get into the you know the phys philosophical aspects of uh of uh modern physics or that kind of thing where uh the 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 mathematics can show that there's an infinite number of universes that those i don't uh, uh, th those are uh, those are theoretical realities they're not practical realities and your reality is completely different than mine i don't think any two realities. we don't share realities i think we share some realities but the whole set of my realities is as individual to me as the whole set of your realities is to you okay how do we, how could we figure out which realities we share and which ones we don't? Well, I think this kind of thing that we're doing right now, I mean, largely, I think people in America share way more than half, probably way more than three quarters of their uh, perceptions, their realities uh, are, are in step with each other. That might be uh, a different number uh, of uh, the realities uh, between uh, someone who is a, a, a native of the United States and a native of Japan or China. But there are certain fundamental human realities, I think. Um, uh, human realities, um, uh, in, in maybe in the past, uh, we called those religions. Um, and some people still do. Uh, uh, but our... Um, uh, wh what we believe in terms of uh, the things that we can't see or touch or hear. Um, and there are a number of things. What lives at the bottom of the ocean? You know, you don't, there's some, some people that have a very scientific uh, uh, view of it. Some people, um, they're, they're not so scientific. Would you say that um, there is there is a reality about what's at the bottom of the ocean, regardless of what people think about it. Yes, uh, but you'd have to visit it, uh, not necessarily you as a person, but it would have to be 
it would have to be visited and documented in order for for enough people, I think, to agree on. We would have to investigate what's there to know the reality. Right. But would you say that if we never went to the bottom of the ocean, would there still be a reality about what's at the bottom of the ocean? I guess is what I'm asking. <laughs> uh, that's a very difficult question. That's, uh, have you ever heard of uh, uh, Schrodinger's cat? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Schrodinger's cat is either alive or not, in depending the box on whether whatever. you look in the box. Yeah. Yeah. In and fact, so it's both alive and not alive unless you look in the box. Okay. So, so it sounds like what you're saying is. I don't know. See, I mean, it's unknowable unless you can verify. Is there a reality happening inside the box, whether we know what's happening inside the box or not? Not according to modern physics. Modern physics says both of those outcomes exist at the same time. Okay. And and that's that that's pretty uh, well backed up by uh, experiments in quantum mechanics. It, it's it, it's beyond I think. An ordinary mortal like me, uh, I, I just don't, I don't have the mental capability of grasping that. So for me, I have to, uh, I have to step back to the next best thing and say, uh, um, I don't accept the fact that Schrodinger's cat is both alive and dead at the same time. I have to say that because I can't see into the box, it's unknowable for me. Okay. Okay, um, are the statements, it's unknowable until we check, and there's two realities happening at the same time, are you using those statements interchangeably? No. Uh, I think there are people who can comprehend uh, the uh, Schrodinger equation. Okay. I can't. It, back to the conclusion... Um, a good life requires adversity. Is it possible for that to be true and not true at the same time with this model? Yes, it's possible, but it's not something that I can comprehend. It's possible that for this to be true and false at the same time. Yes, but but I I can't explain the mechanism of that. Most things, I'm an engineer, mm -hmm. and and most things. Uh, that I run across, unless they're something that I've never had any experience with, I, I can I can come up with some reasonable explanation of the mechanism, but I can't with uh, uh, with uh, things that are true and untrue at the same time. I I just can't process that. Okay. Can Can you think of a statement that you're pretty confident? is true and not true at the same time? I cannot. Why not? Um, well, because true and untrue are mutually exclusive. Okay. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, there was this example that came up in a conversation today where we were talking about this kind of um, a reality, you know, like your reality is different from my reality, but not much. I, I don't want to get I don't I don't want to give you the impression that that I think that that we we don't we don't have any common ground. I think we have yeah. vast common ground, as do most people who are walking down this trail or living in Lacey yeah. or Washington or the United States or the whole world for that yeah. matter. I think we have vast uh, commonality. Okay. So if I, if, if, and this is the example that came up, if I were to say that, um, it's my reality that the wallet in your pocket belongs to me, mm -hmm. um, why would I be mistaken about that? If I, if I said it was my reality though, and reality is based on perception. Right. And, and it's my perception that the wallet that you have belongs to me and that's my reality. Why would I be mistaken about that? Well, uh, um, 
uh, you you may not be in the grand scheme of things, but uh, by by my education uh, and what I know about the law, I can trace the possession of the things in that wallet. Uh, it's possible to trace those back to my own efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, and in our society, classically, that has been uh, the measure of possession. Even so, it's an objective. It's an objective determination, but it is based on social norm. An objective, like, would you say it's it's objectively true that the wallet belongs to you based on what you can provide as far as evidence? Yes. Okay, so sometimes there's a sometimes there's an objective reality, and sometimes the reality is based on perceptions. That's true. Um, for instance, um, you know, uh, uh, there, uh, the question, is there a God, um, is very, very difficult to answer by an objective reality. Some people would disagree with that. Some people of great faith uh, uh, would say, no, there's plenty of evidence of the existence uh, of a God. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but... Um, um, you know, I I don't see. That's one of those things. I um, I don't uh, disagree with that as a possibility, and I don't necessarily agree with it. I have my own uh, faith, but it may be quite different than your faith. You would put that question in that unknowable box. Y yes. Okay. Maybe we can talk about that next time. Next uh, time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Just a couple more questions about sure. this, and um, I've probably taken more of your time than, than uh, are, are you okay on time? Yeah, I've, this has been very interesting. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so back to the conclusion, um, a good life requires adversity. Um, how much does that conclusion affect your behavior? Um, I, think, I think it has... Um, it certainly has an effect. Uh, I mean, I don't go looking for adversity, uh -huh. uh, but um, uh, if um, uh, if something happens in my life, uh, I, I lose something, irretrievably lose something that was important to me. I, uh, uh, some object gets stolen. Uh, maybe it maybe it's something that I really depended on. Uh -huh. Um, that, that's kind of the closest to adversity as, as I get, you know, uh, I, I have a fender bender, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I, um, what, what it does, what the, I think I have developed the ability to look at the, let's take the example of the fender bender. Mm -hmm. Man, that's going to cost, uh, my insurance rates are going to go up. That's bad. That's a, it inconveniences yeah. me because I got to get my car fixed. Yeah. But on the other hand, I'm alive. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had an accident in a in a car where I was in a windstorm and a tree actually fell in front of my car, and I was uh, it was the dark and stormy night, and I was only when it actually hit the ground, I was going at highway speed, and it was only a few feet in front of me. Mm. There was no way to avoid it. I right. hit the tree, and it demolished my car. Mm. Uh, I could have easily died. Uh, but, uh, in the end, I, um, I, I got a bloody nose from my airbag. Oh. Okay. Um, Sometimes the, the airbag causes more damage than... <laughs> well, it, it, but it, 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 clearly I'm glad it was there. Yeah, sure. Uh, 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 I had, uh, a couple of s stiff joints the next morning, mm -hmm. but really that was about all that I had suffered um uh and um uh and my car was actually in the air for some some number of feet because i actually Got shot airborne, right, right over the log wow. uh and i but i i didn't die uh i didn't even uh have to go see the doctor or uh, end up with any hospitalization but it really could have been a different story mm -hmm. and and so with all of those things that I had to do to to dispose of my 
my automobile uh, and insurance covered it uh, and that kind of thing but uh, it still was a um, I was very grateful that I, I hadn't that I, that I hadn't left the world at that particular time yeah yeah so it, so it it's allowed of... it's allowed me I think to to be more holistic about my uh, my immediate point of view. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm very happy uh, right now that my uh, uh, grandson is alive and has an excellent uh, uh, prognosis, but um, that could change. Yeah. He was alive and had a very good prognosis 18 months ago, and it changed awesomely mm. uh, for the negative. Yeah. So uh, without, um, I, don't, I don't want to be in the position where because I'm anticipating adversity, I'm overly pe pessimistic, but yeah. I don't want to be overly optimistic either. Yeah. And, I, and, and so I think it keeps me balanced. Okay. Um, that's, that's kind of how it affects your behavior. It kind of mm -hmm. keeps you balanced and kind of grounded maybe. Yep. And, and maybe more grateful. Yes, kind of very like. much grateful. Yeah. I, I, I am, I am so grateful to be an American. I've traveled over quite a bit of the world, and um, gratitude is a big part of every every time I came back from some place that was kind of in a region that wasn't doing so well. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just I, I couldn't believe how fortunate that I was. Yeah. And I still am. I wake up that way uh, often every day that I have uh, I have as good of prospects as really anyone in history. Uh, and that um, that's almost miraculous. Yeah. And that that kind of contributes to your gratitude. Yes. Very much so. So if you if you were to wake up tomorrow and you somehow, and this is like hypothetically, but uh, somehow you had this knowledge that a good life does not require adversity, how would your behavior change? <laughs> like speci uh, uh, like a specific example of of how your behavior would be different about that. Well, uh, that assumes that this concept of of needing needing adversity to uh, to be a whole human. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that would assume that I could get over the the fact that that's very deeply ingrained in me. Mm -hmm. If I could get over it, it would be. Um, I think there probably would be changes. I, the the but it but it's a complicated question and uh, and <laughs> yeah. and so I mean there are so many dependencies. Uh, yeah, it's a hypothetical coming. thing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, w without really thinking it through, I'm not sure that I could come up with an answer about how my life would change. Yeah, that's okay. I I don't know that I would be. Um, uh, if it would if it would reduce my level of anxiety or increase it, I really don't. I mean, I can see scenarios where it would reduce my level of anxiety. I don't have to look forward to uh, bad things happening to me to keep me strong, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, whether or not okay, so um, maybe you don't need that. Uh, to be strong, that doesn't mean that those bad things won't still happen to you. It just means that you don't need them to keep you strong. So I, I don't know. Again, that uh, that that augurs against it changing the way that yeah. I would. Yeah, it's, look. it's kind of uh, maybe difficult to kind of imagine. Um, so what 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 would you say the main reason is that supports your confidence in this conclusion being true. If you had to choose one reason, the, the, the biggest reason, the reason that supports this conclusion the most, what do you think that would be? I, I think that it, it comes uh, n not from my grandson. I think my grandson's experience uh, um, um, solidified my belief, but mm -hmm. um, I have, um, uh, I, I was a uh, uh, a business owner for a while, and 
you can't own a business without without having some grief come your way every now and then. Mm. Sometimes substantial grief. Uh, uh, you have a debt that you don't know how you're going to pay, or uh, you have an important uh, client that you lost, or mm. there's any number of scenarios where where uh, uh, being associated with a business that you're responsible a lawsuit, for. Lawsuit, maybe. A lawsuit, exactly. Yeah. And I lost my wife five years ago. Um, uh, she'd been ill for a long time, uh, but uh, uh, on, on the day she died, my son actually happened to be here. It was over the holidays. Mm. And um, uh, I, I had to admit to the family, I... Uh, because they actually hadn't seen her, and my son said, "I really didn't realize how how sick mom was." And I said, "Well, you know, I mean, I lived with her for the entire illness, but even so, I still thought I had another six months." Yeah. So. Um, Sorry to hear about your loss. Well, you know, it's uh, it's uh, death is part of life. That's I I I think we've. And to, as I alluded to earlier, I think we've somewhat lost sight of that, um, that uh, it's, it's an important uh, uh, part of, of being able to recognize what you actually have, uh, seeing everything lost by someone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, uh, while I haven't had a, a, the, the suffering we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. the, the great pain, the uh, the, the, the hunger, the fear, uh, the uh, uh, uncertainty that I wasn't accepted, those, those kinds of things. I mean, I still have had uh, things occur in my life that, uh, like everyone else, that um, uh, I didn't really like at the time. And I, and I think that those, um, I, I do think uh, uh, that looking at those things in a balanced way when they happen uh, allowed me to recover from them and not and not get depressed and not withdraw and still be able to uh, 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 greet my friends uh, uh, at um, at my wife's uh, memorial service and and be really happy that they'd been able to show up mm. so you're saying that the main reason that supports this conclusion is the experience that you had with your with the loss of your wife. Would that be the main reason why you believe this? No, I, I think it's I think it's the sum total of all of those experiences and looking back about how I uh, I I can't think of a single instance that that was. Uh, uh, that changed my perception. It, it's this perception has just grown over time, and has been um, um, amplified by by many similar experiences, and and by the, the the positive way that I was able to come out of them, just because I I didn't let the bad things wreck my life. So the sum total sum of total these absolutely. experiences. Yes. That's the main reason. Yes. Okay. Okay. A lot of, in other words, this is one of those kind of things where there's a, a lot of evidence for my belief. Uh, evidence meaning uh, the uh, experiences? Yeah, that, that if, you, if you approach life uh, uh, um, from uh, an optimistic point of view, even if things are going bad for you now, they'll get better, uh, and that something good will come of this. I think thousands of those experiences and and responding to that in the same way most most every time just every time reinforced the fact had it, the few times that i did get depressed it didn't help and things got worse mm -hmm. okay um and so would it be safe to say that the sum total of your experiences is what's supporting your 90% confidence yes, in this. Abso okay. absolutely. Okay. Um, as far as the sufficiency of somebody's experiences, uh, I guess the question is, could somebody, could somebody arrive at a false conclusion using the sum total of their experiences? 
I think it would be very difficult. Um, I, I mean, there are people, I think, that have life-changing experiences, the epiphanies that we hear of, a religious experience or those kind of things. And I, I believe that, that people have those. The experiences, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, not being there, I, I, I can't understand why they happen. I just have to take their word for it. Yeah. And so, and so I guess the question is, is their, their experiences, is that a good reason for them to think that a conclusion that you may think is false is, uh, is true. Yes. Um, uh, ex experience uh, is life's great teacher, but um, there's certainly the possibility that the, uh, the experiences, many experiences that taught you, in fact, were counter to the way other people think. And therefore, you'd have, you would have a different conclusion about what is correct or not correct if that's it's, I, I don't know whether we're talking about correct or incorrect but I don't yeah. think we are but but yes I think you could I, I think it's possible for for a person in isolation for instance to have um, a lot of experience um, I can't give you a, 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 an illustrative example but uh, would have uh, a lot of experience uh, uh, with certain kind of outcome, respond to that outcome in a certain way, and believe that their response was the best possible way that they could have responded, and yet mm -hmm. find that they're that in comparing that to the way other people think, they were in the minority. Okay. Maybe we can use your conclusion as an example. Could somebody? Could somebody conclude that a good life does not require adversity and base that conclusion on their experiences? Yes, they could. And, uh, and, those, and, that, and that experience set would be completely different than mine. Yeah. It, it, it would have to be uh, fundamentally different than mine. Um, that those people came from a different culture, perhaps a different race. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that there's all kinds of reasons that that groups in isolation from one another mm -hmm. can can come to a different conclusion about the same set of facts. Yeah, well, they wouldn't be the same set of facts. They would be the facts as interpreted by those two people. Okay, so they they could come to an opposite conclusion yeah. using the same methods. Yes, I and, and I think that actually uh, that that we have example of that. Um, in um, um, I, I, I've I've read books about uh, life in the 1930s, and um, um, the, there was a lot more. I think in the 1930s there was quite a bit of agreement on what the American way really was, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, than today. And I think that um, uh, the um, uh, the fact that um, uh, there are so many different opinions about uh, the direction that the country ought to take comes from the fact that we're in increasingly isolated from mm -hmm. one another, mm -hmm. that we don't have the opportunity to share um, uh, the, the real profound experiences that we have mm -hmm. uh, with each other. And, and then and then gain a, a better understanding of why other people think the way they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of what this is all about. Yeah. Um, all right, so just just so I'm clear, and this will probably be my last question, and you can ask me whatever you want. Um, if somebody could use this method of, of coming to conclusions, experiences, that is, mm -hmm. to arrive at conclusions you think are false is that a reliable enough method to be 90 percent confident in a conclusion the the fact that other people would disagree um the fact that other people could use their experiences to arrive at a conclusion you think is false if i i see um 
Well, <laughs> that's a very esoteric question again. Um, uh, the if you have, I, I believe, as I said, I have a very high level of confidence that uh, the basic pre premise, which mm -hmm. is uh, uh, I adversity, is actually good for people uh -huh. to a degree. Yeah. Um, and that, and that somebody else would completely disagree with that. Um, so, if if I understood they disagreed with my premise, would that shake my ninety percent confidence? Well, I don't think it would. But they're uh, not, not that they would disagree, but they're using this. That they're using the same reasons you are to come to the an opposite conclusion. That's what I'm at. Like I I'm interested in. Why is ninety percent a good place to be using using they they methods. would they wouldn't have had the same experience that I did because um, in the way I uh, attempted to describe it was it, it's almost like um, a um, uh, a stimulus response kind of thing I. Um, I uh, experienced adversity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I responded in a certain way, uh, and I was better off because I responded that way. Mm -hmm. So if someone else had had that same experience and and reacted to it the same way I did, they would have had the same stimulus and response, and it would have been virtually impossible for them to come to a new, different conclusion. Mm. So if they had, uh, but if they had a legitimate disagreement because they had actually a similar experience, they'd responded in the same way that I did, mm -hmm. and things went very badly for them, then that, that would be an example of uh, a, a stimulus that uh, resulted in a negative response. Right. So um, those two situations can't be equal. It's, a, it's again, something can't be true and untrue at the same time. And that the reason that that uh, you, you uh, that um, that that could possibly happen is perception, mm -hmm. because my perception being one thing, can be at total odds with your perception of the same right. thing. Yep. But we're not experiencing the same things. We can't, or we'd come, I believe we'd come to the same conclusions. We're experiencing something different to come to different conclusions. And you were saying that reality depends on the perception. Yes. Okay. So cool. those are all intertwined, and I'm not sure how you would untangle them. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd be the last person in the world to be critical of someone who said, um, well, uh, that, is, that's, that's yeah, just hogwash. Yeah, yeah. Because I can, I can perfectly well uh, um, think of a way that they could come to that conclusion, yeah. but they haven't had the same experiences that I have. I, that's what I believe. I don't think two people, two rational people, having uh, the 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 same uh, uh, experience uh, from a given situation uh, and coming to completely different conclusions, um, there there there's something different between those two people. Mm -hmm. Their realities have to be somewhat different in order to, I I, I think. Uh, uh, Come, come to the conclusion that they did. That's fundamental to science. Mm -hmm. The physics is the same all over the universe. That that's what science is based on. If if the perception of one scientist is different uh, than another regarding a certain phenomena, then they are experiencing fundamentally different things. Mm -hmm. Yet, yet there's a. Would you say that there's still this reality that's beyond their perceptions, even if they don't know that reality it, yet? It's unknowable. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, yeah, it could be. I mean, that happens in science where, where um, um, somebody uh, 
observe something in the heavens and it contradicts one of the apparently contradicts one of the laws of physics that that happened with regard to um, um, I, I think it was pulsars where they they said there's no no object could generate that much energy mm -hmm. but then they found out that it really wasn't that the energy was focused at the poles of the object and when the spin was exactly right so that it's like a flashlight you know coming around at you every time that it that that flashlight illuminated earth then they would perceive that as this very highly concentrated energy and in fact it was and they they thought no that's that's a uh, uh, that, that's a well distributed uh, bit of energy that's that's coming on and going off and when it's coming on it's just impossibly powerful and so then they found out well it isn't if you if you change the way you model the phenomena mm -hmm. so uh, then more people if not all people agreed on yeah, that's pretty much the only way you could explain that. They kind of updated. Right. They kind of updated the model. Right, and yet before that, there were people who um, had uh, uh, were just completely puzzled by it because it seemed to violate uh, uh, very well established physical laws. Mm -hmm. I know I said I had that last question was my last question, <laughs> uh, but if if it's okay, I can ask one more. Yes. Um, does, does reality require a mind? Does it, if a tree falls in the forest, does it, does it make a sound? Uh, you know, they, they seem to have answered that. I remember the explanation, but I can't recite it. What do you think? Oh, yes. I, I think that sound, sound as we define it, um, uh, happens if nobody's there to hear it. Uh, I mean, the, the the waves go through the atmosphere. Um, so you're saying that reality does not require a mind? Um, if there were no humans uh, in the universe, would the universe exist? Is or, that or any minds? Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. In, any. In, any. Um, you could even say brains. Does does a, does reality require bra brains to to exist? I, I'm just not competent to answer that question. Honestly, I, I, that, that is, uh, um, I would personally, I, I, it, it gets down to just a complete guess because I have no, nobody has any evidence to support it. It's a guess, an opinion. And I think without um, uh, sentient beings uh, or without consciousness, uh, that there would still be the stars and the heavens and uh, uh, planetary bodies and mm -hmm. vast space. I think those things and that would would exist as they do now. You 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 would say what what I'm hearing you saying is that it's that you're convinced that the Earth was here before there were any brains on it. Yes. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I believe that. Um, I I think that that. And of course, uh, uh, and I, I don't want to get into trouble with creationists <laughs> because they have a right to their opinion as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the evidence is is that um, there was a time when there was no life of any kind on Earth, sentient or otherwise. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, what I'm asking about. Right, like... and it and it and the Earth, in fact, did exist because we have evidence of what the Earth was like because of chemical reactions that could have happened no other way than for those conclusions to be drawn and to show that Earth, in fact, did exist. In fact, that the solar system existed before Even Earth though there's existed. no perception of it. Even though there's no perception, yeah. But I won't get into the... I, I, I really... I mean, not that I refuse, I just don't... I don't know. Yeah, what, no, that's Okay, great. is there... Um, so, what does that say about creation? I... I, I think that you could have no uh, um, no sentient beings in that uh, it's possible that a supreme being could 
be beyond that level of sentience, and that uh, it's it, it's possible mm. that it uh, that uh, the those things were set in motion by a supreme being long before mankind was created by him as, or her as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I, don't, I don't think that the scientific explanation for things in any way discounts the possibility for these other things. The possibility, yeah. The yeah. possibility. I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't necessarily think that those things are probable, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm certainly willing to entertain somebody who um, is um, a, uh, uh, who, who uh, lives by the, the Hindu philosophy of creation or the uh, uh, Christian philosophy, Judeo-Christian mm -hmm. philosophy of creation. I, I think that those are, are uh, or for that matter, uh, yeah, I, I lived in Arizona for a while. I was fascinated by uh, the Hopi story mm. of creation. It's, it's remarkably similar to ours. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, I've read a little bit about some of the native native stories about yeah. creation. And, and uh, there, there are a it's lot of similarities to uh, to creation stories all over the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, there's obviously there's details that are different, but. Sure. Um, so, I mean, if there's so many similarities, how can that many people from different places without contact with each other come up with things that are so similar mm -hmm. in a kind of a similar period of time? Yeah. I, I, I've, I, one, the, the great thing about being a scientist, I think, is the, the wonder of it all. Yeah. If you don't have a closed mind, you can accept um, uh, the creation stories and uh, uh, and the, even to the uh, belief of Noah's Ark and mm -hmm. and Adam and Eve and those kind of things as 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 being the very interesting explanations of things that um, that we know may have happened in a different way, but certainly the result was the same. Mm -hmm. So. I, I try to keep an open mind. I, um, I've always been more, uh, more, more delighted by uh, the by uh, new opinions and, and new art, new music, and, and that kind of thing, than if I decide, well, no, uh, all of the best music is behind us. All of the best <laughs> ideas are behind us. We can explore that one next time too. Yeah. It's really coming down. Do you have any questions for me? Are are, are you um, a, a student? Are you are you doing this uh, just for your own edification? Or? It's a hobby. Uh -huh. um, I'm a student of epistemology. Yeah. Um. And the 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 practice that we're going through is called street epistemology. Mm -hmm. And my I know what the word is. Yeah, yeah. Um. So my my hobby is to upload these conversations onto my YouTube channel. Uh -huh. The YouTube channel is called Sound Epistemology. Oh, okay. Like the Puget Sound. Yeah. Um, are, are, are you a native or a resident of Washington? Are you traveling through here doing these interviews? I've lived in the Olympia area for over 20 years. Oh, so okay. it's it's home. I've li lived here longer than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So this, this is home for me. Um, and I'll often be here up and down uh, this this trail, the Shalos Western Trail, um, I'm up at Capitol Lake, mm. uh, some of the parks around here. Yeah. Um, just to have, just to kind of create this space for people to um, really explore um, what they think is true, mm -hmm. and and even more importantly, explore how they arrived there, mm -hmm. and and what they're using to support that confidence. And sometimes, just by doing that, um, 
they get to explore their own mm -hmm. reasoning process. Uh, and, you know, I'm not sure there's enough of that yeah, happening. You know what I'm, you know what I, I mean? I, engineers are all trained in critical thinking. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, um, this is uh, basically guided cr critical thinking. Right. Uh, you, you, you have to, um, um, <laughs> you, you know, how, how the, the classic phrase, uh, that you always hear your first day of engineering school is how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? <laughs> and that, uh, you, uh, uh, how, how do you solve a problem? Well, uh, the problem has never been done before. So uh, you break it down into small components that you can solve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you put those together in a way that you believe will lead to a solution to the overall problem. Mm -hmm. And then you test that. You take and, little chunks. Right. And then you try and, and you use the experience of testing uh, and failure, mm -hmm. uh, because failure is very, very important uh, to engineering development. Yeah. Uh, and then you build that into uh, a set of new knowledge that you can use to uh, make an electric vehicle, uh, uh, accomplish space exploration, um, all, all kinds of, of, of technology. And so having a way, having a way to tell if it failed the test. That being able to define what what is accepted as being the truth, mm -hmm. because I, I some of your questions were um, were interesting to me because um, they uh, they they did test my ability to uh, to properly define what the limits of my answer might be because. Uh, you can't have an unlimited answer. You have uh, all answers are the response to a question, and a question is uh, a a narrow phrase that requires a response within that narrow context. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you have to know what the terms of the question, how they're defined. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It understanding the definitions yep yeah we we kind of we kind of went through that a little bit like definition of reality yep um adversity we kind of talked a little bit right. like the differences between adversity and and uh, suffering um that kind of thing so yeah but i mean there's all, there's other... all of these things that we had trouble with are subjective things uh, it, it's very it, it's very difficult to have controversy over thing over something that's really not subjective um if you fall off a hundred-story building, you will die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even even if I were to say that in my reality, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. You will cease to exist as as we know the living to be. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, without without some kind of an aid to uh, to to break your fall. Um, it, it will be what most of us consider to be a fatal event. So there, it, there are facts about the world that we share mm -hmm. that are either true or false, regardless of how we feel about it. There are not many, actually. I, I, um, in fact, uh, from the scientific perspective, there's only 20 or 30 fundamental physical truths. And everything else is built from combinations of those things. How do you how do you determine which ones are in that thirty and which ones aren't? Well, um, that's just what the physicists have have learned are invariant. Okay. Uh, the fine tuning constant is a good example. That's the that's the conclusion that the scientific community has come up with. Yeah, and and you can measure that particular. Uh, uh, function in a number of different ways and always get the same answer. Uh. You can measure it all over the world and, and get the same answer. You can, uh, um, if you use different measuring systems, you'll get the same, you'll get a different answer, but it's proportional to the other answers. Yeah, yeah so there, there's, there's a, a, 
a, a number of those things in in physics that uh, uh, define all the rest of the measurements we take <coughs> in physics. Not very many of them. Uh, Planck constant is another one. It's the Planck constant. It, it's constant. <laughs> That's why they call it the constant. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So it would be difficult <laughs> if you accepted what how the Planck constant is defined, mm -hmm. um, it would be difficult, I think, uh, I, I accept the possibility that you could come up with a different Planck constant in your reality. Uh, but if we agreed on each and every term of the definition, it would be, I don't know how you, how you could. Yeah. But yeah. like I, um, uh, you believe, um, uh, I don't know how you believe, but uh, uh, that uh, there uh, that there is no one reality is that do you have do you have a suspicion that that might be the case? I'm convinced that that reality, the way I kind of define it or see it, um, is is there independent of minds, independent of. Perceptions. I agree. I and I think I I. Uh, confirm that I'm with you on that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, kind of how I see it. Like, kind of like we were talking about Earth. Earth was here, and it didn't require a brain. No. no for I, it to exist. I, I. But that's only a belief that I have. I don't. I don't have evidence of that. Because mm -hmm. the universe is contaminated by brains we can't observe it without brains yeah so that's what i was <laughs> going to say i mean even if we even if we don't have access to objective truth or mm -hmm. objective reality um i think it's still there but yeah I, I, i'm not convinced that um that i have access to it based on my biases mm -hmm. based on my perceptions and my fallibility, my my ability to be wrong. Yeah, you know. but also knowledge uh, opens up those um, those fundamental truths. Uh, thing, fundamental truths that evaded us. Uh, for instance, Newton's law is a good example of that. Before 1620, they they really didn't know what he codified by his observation of the universe. Mm -hmm. And, and then we, we accepted that. It, it's an imperfect law, but it's pretty darn close. Uh, and, I, and I think that that's the kind of thing that happens is that you're, it's, uh, it's an expanding reality yeah. all the time. Yeah. That you, you have Keep no, updating our, our knowledge exactly. based and on then, the information uh, that we Exactly. Get. And then more and more things can be shown not to be mere opinions, but you know, it's pretty much like that. Whether, whether we believe it or right. not, yeah. Exactly, whether we believe it or not, um, uh, the, the world, uh, don't bet against it because it's a steamroller that'll go right over you. <laughs> that, that, those, are the, those are the kind of things that yeah. we learn all the time. Yeah. Um, and as long as, as mankind exists, or really any uh, creative being, I think that's gonna be the case, that the sum total of things that we know to be true will grow uh, uh, without bound. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tom, okay. this, is, this has been and, great. I really appreciate you stopping. Oh yeah, I uh, enjoyed it. Again, Sound Epistemology, that's my YouTube channel. If you uh, you hop on YouTube often. Yeah, I do, I, okay. and you're, uh, yeah. Yeah, my name's David. Yeah. Um, that's my YouTube channel. Street Epistemology is the practice of what we did. This is basically my expression of, of this whole idea. Um, you, you'd probably be really interested in, in some oh, of the I conversations Oh, I think so, because it's a, there. yeah. Um, um, I think uh, it, it, it's a very challenging subject because um, uh, it, um, it, it makes you think clear down to your core beliefs. Yeah, and, and beliefs affect behavior. Yes, they do. And that affects the rest of us. And that's why I think it's important to offer this exploration with people. Yeah. In, in my no, community. I agree. I, I think that uh, we don't have. Uh, I think we're all too isolated mm -hmm. from one another. That that the different points of view are are not 
debated enough. We, there's nothing wrong with disagreement. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, without a kind of a marketplace of ideas, you, 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 can't, you can't really come to an understanding with people. Um, you may not change their mind, but at least if you can get uh, some sense that I don't really agree with that, but uh, I, I respect your opinion and you personally enough mm, sure. uh, to, uh, uh, to, to not um, violently resist what you're saying. Sure, yeah. I, I, that, that's what I think we, we have fallen to in many cases. Is yeah, and not attaching their beliefs to their identity. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good point because um, that's, I think, um, the, 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 sin, the, the sin of the, of the 21st century has been that, uh, that uh, I, uh, I am this because I do that. Mm -hmm. Or you are this because you do that. Uh, you do that, right. right. And that, and that we're, we're fundamentally different, we'll never get together. Yeah, yeah I, that, that's, uh, I, I believe that, that that borders on a pathology today and that um, it's something that we need to come to grips with in in a way that can be resolved peacefully because it's it's getting very scary you you know that I I'm armed did you understand that I was armed mm -hmm. and I'm armed because I'm afraid of what my federal citizen might do to me while I walk this trail and I would defend myself and I Maybe they're, maybe I'm wrong and they're right, but uh, I don't believe violence is the, uh, violence perpetrated on a person who is attempting to be a peaceful citizen is right in any case. Yeah. Before I forget, your wallet didn't fall out oh. of your pocket there, and, and your, looks like your phone's about to, too. It looks like it just <laughs> took the plunge. Um, I thought it was kind of funny because we were talking about <laughs> Me, me taking your wallet and in my reality and it's mine, yeah. <laughs> and it falls out of your pocket. Yeah. So it's, uh, All right, David. Well, I, I did awesome. enjoy this. Uh, this was very entertaining, which I, I hope that doesn't offend you. I'm so. glad that you stopped. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for talking with me today. I really All appreciate right, we'll it. I'll look up your, uh, uh, your organization and, uh, uh, because I think that um, that, that worldview may in fact um, be uh, something that if it were more widely not accepted but more widely um, recognized mm -hmm. uh, would uh, would be very good for, in particular for America because America's got some pro problems of people listening to each other yeah yeah this kind of helps give people a demonstration of a conversation that people can have that can sometimes be about sensitive topics too. Yep. Oh yeah, and, and that's I think once once you get um, uh, past the the more uh, easy ones like um, you know is is there one reality? Yeah. Uh, and you start <laughs> uh, you know talking about the the ones that are kind of landmines. Um, uh, I mean, that, the, the first one gives you the experience of dealing with those issues so that you have a little bit more confidence of opening up the subject that may be, as you say, more sensitive. Because, okay, we came to an agreement to disagree on the other. Maybe we can do the same thing without uh, throwing punches on yeah, this. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, enjoy your walk. Okay. And it's good to meet you, Rose. Well, be, you be good. Loves your walks. I'll give you another treat next time. Okay. Did you hear that, Rosie? <laughs> yeah, she says, we got to come down here four times. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>